to it and understanding how can we use this powerful technology in a non-GMO manner. The great news there on the regulatory path is that there's two precedents already established in the ag world of a non-regulated, non-GMO white button mushroom from Penn State where they just use CRISPR in a non-GMO way and bring in a new DNA to knock out a gene that is responsible for the browning of the white mushroom. FDA said non-GMO, USDA said non-GMO. And the same for waxy corn from DuPont Pioneer. He's obviously been working on this for a long time. Those two are milestone rulings because they open the door for the whole ag field moving forward. And this is why I think in the end, the ag world will win the CRISPR craze to the market, not medicine. And if you think of some ag technologies, right, plants like blueberries and carrots could be enhanced if you know the right pathways to push around to make them healthier. They're really healthy, make them better, right? You can do precision breeding of livestock for chickens. I mentioned the horns for cattle. You can make CRISPR probiotics. You can make antiphage uh, starter cultures, and you can change the microbiome when you use CRISPR as antimicrobial. This is just the beginning. That CRISPR element right here has made it to many a lab. It's a great topic. It's a great time. This is the right industry to leverage CRISPR. There's some colorful people. But most importantly, the opportunities are there as long as you're mindful of the ethics, the regulatory pathways, and the PR. So I hope this was a worthy overview. A few minutes per question of the CRISPR science, how those CRISPR systems get turned to technologies that are useful for a plethora of applications in many different fields, how it's made an impact from a scientific standpoint, from a media standpoint, from an industrial and business standpoint, and how essentially people who are doing this for a living are mindful of the ways it can be harnessed. The challenge is that the pace at which science is advancing is outpacing the pace at which this dialogue can occur, okay? I'm gonna thank you for your attention. I'm gonna thank all the colleagues I've had over time. I'm gonna uh, thank the governmental agencies with whom we work. There are many people at NC State and beyond doing CRISPR work. And then I'm gonna disclose some funding I get from DuPont and Pioneer and DharmaCon, as well as my being on the board of directors of Caribou, being an advisor and uh, co-founder of Intelia, an advisor and co-founder of Locus Biosciences. Thank you. <laughs> and we'll I'll take a few questions, time permitting. Massimo. Hi. So, Rudolf, a question. So, about the possible application of CRISPR in uh, plant breeding, I have seen some companies starting, startup company, using, uh, choosing uh, a different technology for genome editing just because of patenting issue, possible patenting issue on release of a new variety. What is like the status for CRISPR in terms of if an, a private company want to use CRISPR to release a new variety in terms of patenting the application? Yeah, so, so, so there's, there's two issues actually. So, so one is freedom to operate in regards to the IP and what is the regulatory pathway. So the, up until recently, about 12 weeks ago, there was no regulatory approval for the use of CRISPR for plant breeding. So really, people are using CRISPR as a research tool, but they're using first-generation generating machines like meganucleases, talons, and ZFNs to do commercial breeding. Now that the regulation has changed or has been updated or has sent signals that CRISPR is gonna be construed as non-GMO, the ongoing undermining research pipeline is transitioning into a commercial pipeline. So it's a question of time until we start seeing some bigger companies who do classical, classical genome editing <laughs> use CRISPR. This, it's in the works. The second issue is about the IP and freedom to operate from an IP standpoint, which is the number one hurdle in the ag industry because the ag rights to the CRISPR-based machine is under what's called a legal interference and a patent interference of the patent office. 
Um, and because some of those large companies have probably billions of dollars at stake and would have to pay millions of dollars in, in terms of uh, gaining access to freedom to operate for their crop of interest, uh, they're probably going to wait until November this year when a potential ruling is going to come out and the first indication of the interference proceedings will, may come out from, from the, the, the USPTO. Um, but in terms of research, it doesn't preclude people from using it. So you can get a research license very affordably, whether you're a startup, mid-ag, or big-ag, um, but we'll have to wait for the IP to come out. I mean, if, if my recommendation is to wait for the IP to come out. But in terms of research purpose, outside of, of the walls of, of um, the business in academia, pe people use, on a very broad scale, generating for crops. Whether you see the, uh, um, the, the legal land, uh, sort of landscape changing with regard to um, sort of the subtractive use of, of uh, CRISPR, the idea that genetically modified means addition and, and subtracting is not genetically modified. Certainly, it, it will change the phenotype. So do you see the legal landscape changing in the future with regard to this sort of subtractive editing versus the addition, which is considered GMO at this point? So that actually, that's an excellent question because it's spot on. No, no pun intended, but it's, it's literally spot on. So as, as currently defined, GMO is construed as bringing a foreign piece of DNA into your lawn. And you can do that using CRISPR, but this is not what's been used up until now. You just use CRISPR to take things out. So you don't bring in any foreign DNA. By definition, from a regulatory standpoint, black and white, there's no interpretation whatsoever this is not GMO. I, I've had the conversation with a couple of people, and consistently, at least thus far, there's no rationale whatsoever for redefining or changing the definition. Because this is a definition that everybody agrees on, have agreed upon, and it has worked until now. So the question is, does this not work anymore? And we need to reassess how to define GMO versus non-GMO. Um, or is it all about exogenous DNA or not? And some of the rationale that, that is gaining steam about the removal or the changing is that if you can show that this could be a natural event and it could occur in nature, there's no reason to label it GMO whatsoever. So some of the examples that I showed with um, the, the targeting to unearth rare genotypes that naturally exist because it occurs naturally in nature, quote unquote, this is a non-GMO approach. How sustainable it is, it's yet to be seen. But I would say at this point in time, the, the, the signs point to no change. Any more, please? Um, so from the scientific perspective, you, you made a comment about HIV and having to do a dual cut on there. Um, but then earlier in the talk, you have the, both the types that you have the scissors and then you have the kind of non-discriminant Pac-Man that just gobbles. How far away is CRISPR from doing a really exact dual cut? So you can actually use two guides. So this is how you're going to do a dual cut. So when, when, when HIV-1 gets inserted, when pro-HIV-1 gets inserted into the cell as an active cycle type virus into the, the genome of the host, then this is where you have to do a, both terminal and targeting. So you do two different cuts using two different guides for the same cast. That's how you excise the inserted provirus outside of the host genome. Currently, the processivity with which the Pac-Man chews up DNA unidirectionally is such that you can't control where it stops. You could control where it stops using an anchor or using another NIC, for example, because it's a single-strand targeting. But for the HIV um, and HPV and HBV and Hep C to date, uh, the uh, excision strategy is the only one that I've seen that works. One thing noteworthy, though, which I didn't mention, but it's cool for HIV, is that once the guys are in the cell, you don't just excise what's in inserted, you are also immune against future infection. Thank you for an absolutely wonderful talk. I was completely ignorant of CRISPR until today. 
So I applaud you on allowing me to understand it. Um, incredibly elegant science, um, and I get it, and I'm pretty sure most people in the room get it, but I bet you there's 100 people in the food line across the road who don't, and they're the ones who actually buy fruits and vegetables, and I'm thinking this in a, in a food sense. What's your opinion on what's, what's the biggest obstacle for the consumer to accept the fact that this is non-GMO versus the USDA just saying it's non-GMO? So, so there's, there's, there's two issues to me. One, one is, is regulatory and whether you trust or not the agencies in charge thereof, whether the PR by those agencies and the messaging by those agencies is, is done correctly or not, and the same with the industry, and that's what has plagued the industry and, and GMOs at the outset. I'm not going to blame Monsanto or other people necessarily. Um, but I think that the regulatory PR is typically underwhelming, and people don't understand how it works and don't necessarily trust governmental agencies. I mean, I think that's, that's a challenge that's outside of the scope of academics, but it, it's an issue. But the second issue, which is the biggest issue, is educating the public. And there's two things there. I think, I think the public is smarter than people think, but it's also more opinionated than people think. So there's a conundrum there. Um, and then at the same time, scientists do a really poor job at PR. And then maybe they're not as smart as they think they are. <laughs> and maybe the gap between what they want to do and what they want to achieve is not as big as they think they are. So I, I know a lot of people, I've been talking to a lot of people about CRISPR documentaries and CRISPR movies and outreach and putting stuff on YouTube and on, 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 on Yahoo and Facebook and all that stuff to educate the public about CRISPR. Um, and the challenge is that the science is happening at such a high pace that it's important, but it's very seldom a priority for the educator. And, and I haven't yet, I mean, I'm yet to see a true outstanding strategic PR model that's going to get us there. But I think it's an opportunity more than a challenge. I think that there's no damage yet. There's no issues yet. There's a few anti-CRISPR picketing people here and there in the world, that, predictably. And there's reasons to be concerned to some extent. I'm not saying there's not. Um, but I'm saying some of the very qualified people are at the table having those conversations right now. So the National Academy of Science has had a couple of meetings about this. And they're proactive, the Royal Society um, in both Canada and in the UK, Great Britain, whatever they are those days, is making a good job. Um, so, and, and, and the, the, the regulatory agencies in Europe as well are doing this. So there's signs to be hopeful to some extent, but the opportunity cost for the people who know the most is so high right now because they have to submit a paper every 2.4 weeks. They have to get the next grant, they have to get the next award, they have to get their next book in, they have to get, you know, they have so many things to do that however high that is on their list, as of today, it still hasn't made it to the very top. Conversely, there's things like the GES Center we have at NC State right, right, for educating society. Um, and there's people like Fred Gold, you know, who are mindful of it, Jennifer Kuzma, who are mindful of it, and write about it and talk about it. But I think the scale at which it's happening is nowhere near what it needs to be. And I think this is where the industry, I think, has, has a leading role to play. Um, I mentioned here, I didn't talk about it because it's on the slide, is, is if you, if you want to be a leading industry, an ag should be it for CRISPR, because it's going to make it to the shelf before pharma is going to take it to the clinic. There's an opportunity, if not a duty, to be there as an industry. But within the industry, that's where we need the industry leaders to kind of come in at the table and discuss and assess it. How are we going to do the PR around this? What's the strategy? What's the plan? How are we going to execute this? And, and this is where people who claim to be leaders of plant breeding, people who claim to be leaders of ag and big ag, whether it's the big four, the big six, or however we do the math with the, the, the trends in consolidation from a business standpoint, they have to do that. And they have to do that well, because if they don't, it'll be a huge disservice to them. And then by the way, to the rest of the world. So I think, you know, some of the people I talk to are mindful of it. They're being nudged from within, sometimes from without, into that, that discussion and conversation. Um, and I'd rather them be a little bit slow, but do the right thing, than be too fast and be underwhelming or have the, the PR kind of, you know, hit, hit the crapshoot, literally. Um, 
but it has to happen. And, and I'm, not, I'm not, you know, I don't know everything about everything, let alone CRISPR. Um, I think there's good signs, but we're not done yet. It's kind of the IP and, and the rest. Good signs, but we're not there yet. There's a ways to go. Thank you. All right, I'll be here for lunch. Thank you all. Rudolph, thank you for such a compelling talk. Let's have another round of applause for our keynote. At this point, I would like to invite everyone to enjoy lunch outside these doors. If you're interested in a vegetarian option, uh, just let one of the catering staff know. Thank you. Um, also, too, when you all leave out, there are two lines. You self-serve, so you can go right or you can go left. Thank you. <laughs>